Hello everyone and welcome back. I got another retreat for you. I haven't done one of these in a minute. They're a little bit harder to record because I got to do two videos because I usually do these over a couple months or about a month or so with Cosmic Hydroxide. Anyways, you can see short fill there, but it's actually a lateral canal, I believe, that was causing her pain, as you can see on there. So let's get started. I didn't have the blue diamond on my bar block here, so we're using the little tiny purple guy. It doesn't really matter for a PFM. The porcelain's nice and soft. You just need something to cut through it that's not going to cause any chipping. You don't want to use a carbide here, obviously. And when I'm doing my retreats, the access, I tend to go a little bit larger than I would if I were the first one in, just because historically accesses have been more of the pathways of the pulp. Let's see all the canals at once. So you know that there's already going to be composite there. I don't really care if I have to remove more composite. I can, I'm concerned about removing more dentin. So use the metal burr and then go into the workhorse burr, burr here. What I like to do is you'll notice the water's off for this part because composite creates a very different pattern of dust than tooth structure does. And my goal here is to only remove composite. So you can see I'm almost doing a brushing stroke here, and I'm trying to isolate both mesally and distally. I will sometimes switch to using the prep burr as well because it's a little bit larger and removes the composite more effectively. Composite tends to gunk up that really skinny 014 burr, and so this is a much larger one designed, well, pretty much to prepare crowns. So it is designed to effectively get rid of the composite. Once I remove the bulk of it and can start to see the pink showing through from the existing gutta percha, I'll then punch through back again with the long skinny diamond. That's the workhorse, workhorse, that's a really hard word for me to say apparently, workhorse burr. I feel like Ron Burgundy right now. Unique New York. And I'll start to, you can see I'm actually kind of dropping into the area exactly where that pink gutta percha is. And so that's how you, one way to find the canals when you're doing a retreat. You want to go slowly. This isn't one where you need to rush it at all because just follow the composite and you'll find it. Now, as far as retreats, the first thing I do is I use heat to remove the bulk of the coronal gutta percha. My little cordless unit gets up to 230 degrees Celsius, which is hot enough usually to remove at least that coronal third. This also creates almost a purchase point for my F1 to go into. A few of you were asking how fast I spin my rotaries, so here we are. F1s, I'm going to spin real fast at the beginning because I'm not really worried about breaking. If the tip does break off, it's going to be in a sea of gutta percha and it's easy to flip back out. And the key here is you want that speed to cause friction, which will then cause heat and pulls the gutta percha out. So I'm not really using the file, the flutes of the file to remove the gutta percha as much as I am using heat to pull it out. F1s are a great shape for this as well. They're a very active and really broad as far as the flute design. I can't believe, hopefully there is one person out there who also cares about flute design like I do because <laughs> when I talk to general dentists about this, their eyes just glaze over. So hopefully there's a few nerds out there just like me who want to care about this. And remember, I've already got length, my estimated length off of the comb beam. I think my estimate is like 21.5. Working length ended up being 21. So I'm only down at about 18, 17 millimeters right now. I'm not really worried about stressing out the file or causing any issues. And you can see the the reason that there's a lot of cuts is because I'm constantly cleaning off those flutes. As soon as they become filled with that, I want to clean that off. You may be saying, well, why don't you use chloroform? Well, you can here. I've just found that chloroform creates a big mess and it really doesn't make anything faster for me. The, the speed at which I'm able to remove the gutta percha, I think is actually faster. You'll also notice I'm using water here instead of rinsing with any of the side vented tips. The reason why is in these chunks like this, very, very common for them to start to clog the, the uh, cannula really quickly with me. So I'm now remove the bulk of the gutta percha and I'm going to start kind of going past those areas where the ledges were because remember all four canals were short. So starting off here with the 2006, you can see I'm not getting anywhere whatsoever with that. The distals though are looking pretty good. Um, still in a lot of gutta percha on both of the mesials and you can see I'm really not getting down very far. Same thing here. MB is a little, little bit better. You know, I'm probably around 18, 19 there, which is where we are. But at this point I removed enough gutta percha that I'm going to start rinsing with the Triton material to start killing bacteria. Because remember, that is what we do want to do here on a retreat. Bacteria are the main cause of failure in these cases, so got to kill it up. <laughs> Going back in now with that F1 on the mesolingual in particular, and you can see I'm, I'm 
poking in and I get down about a millimeter at a time. It just showed you there. I do have to clean off the gutta purchase as soon as you see it kind of go in there. And I'm usually do like a one, two, three as far as how much I'm going down. If I start to feel it drop like that, I may go a little bit farther. But I'm not pressing very hard here. That's the key is you, you, this is how you strip perf. This is how you transport a canal is you push way too hard. This thing isn't a DeWalt. <laughs> you want to do it with light, gentle force. Let the speed and the friction do the work for you. And you can see how it almost pulls down into the canal as I'm going in. The, the distals look great here. MB looks great as well. And you'll see it's just that ML where I'm still short, probably about six millimeters or so right now. As gutta percha ages, as you know, the tooth and the patient, you know, it's attached to age, it does go through some chemical changes, dries out, and it does become a lot harder and more difficult to remove. You can see getting a few good chunks out there still. And what I wanted to show here is just how we are starting to see some bubbling. Uh, someone asked me my irrigation technique and kind of how I plan for these things. Well, in this case, I'm going to plan that the calcium hydroxide is going to do most of the work anyway. <laughs> but I want to use as much pretty much bleach containing products, in this case, Triton, at the beginning to remove the organic material. And then I'll switch to EDTA if I need to. I'm now using an SX here uh, on that mesolingual in particular because it's a lot more aggressive in the coronal aspect and helps remove gutta percha that might be st sticking in the way. And it doesn't do too, too much in the apical area. This shape was probably, let's say an F2 to begin with. And from, you know, my 1704, 2006 isn't really gonna do anything there. You can see that little bit stuck sticking between the two teeth here. I'll go after that in just a minute, but just wanna show you with that 2006, I am spinning this a little bit faster. This one's probably at about 550 again. And we are looking really good on everything except for that mesial lingual right now. So um, you'll see kind of how I address this here in just a minute, but we're getting almost way down to the bottom. I like using headstroms to remove any gutta percha that's stuck in the isthmus or the area in between the canals because they're pulling motion. It may not grab the piece in one you know, solid piece, but what it does do is kind of shreds it and makes it a lot easier for the irrigants or your next files to pull it up. So don't be disheartened if you don't get it out in one cool piece. It's fun when that happens, but if you can at least shred it and get it a little bit loose, much higher likelihood that the rest of the materials you're going to use are going to get it. So at this point, I'm pretty much patent on most of them. Um, I was able to get two of the links here. Now we're still a little bit short on the others, so you'll see me going back down now. I've taken the stopper off because I am going to shape these to an F1. Why am I going so large? Well, because that's what the natural shape was to begin with. Really, the, the difference in an F1 and a 2006 and the apical two millimeters that I need to go isn't that big of a difference, and it's a lot easier to squirt fill an F1 shape, which you'll see in a few minutes. But that's why we're going down there. Now, F1 obviously is... Um, a very large file in by today's standards. Back in the day, that was actually a very skinny file. I find that I like to get two length working with these smaller files to begin with. So that's why you'll see me go back to the 2006 and you'll even see me go back to the 17. The distal buckle canal also had a little bit of uh, ledging as well. And as you can see, I'm not all the way painted on there. So for those of you keeping score at home, MB is looking great. DL is looking great. The others need a little bit of help. So you can see that pecking motion that I'm doing here. And I like to start with the larger file first because it removes gutta percha more effectively. And then eventually I'll get down here to the 17 because now we're working on the actual canal. I don't really want to take an F1 down a calcified canal because it's so large it's not gonna really do anything for me. The 17, however, is nice and skinny and will follow that shape a lot better. On the distal, I started with a 15 just to make sure I can kind of poke down into the area. It felt like I just had like a millimeter to go, which is all I think I really did. Um, sorry for the video. It's, it's, it's hard to make, you know, watch winding look cool <laughs> on a video, but that's what we're doing here is taking that 15 down because if I can get a 15 to length, then I just need to go up to one hundredths of a millimeter to get the 17 to length. That's kind of the thought process here, but I was still running into a lot of gutta percha on that ML. So I'm going back in now with the 2006, just trying to get patent with these two. You can see we're still just a little bit short, but on those distals, now we're looking pretty good, except for that guy right there. That distal lingual still has a little bit of work to do. So you'll see how I manage that here in just a minute. Now, what we're doing is going through these again. This it seems very repetitive here, but this is pretty much the way that you get down these cases is slow repetition. Sometimes you're only getting a half millimeter at a time, and that's okay. As long as you're still making progress, you should feel 
that stickiness, almost like you're going into a piece of rubber. If you feel like you're going into a piece of metal, that's when you need to back out and do a couple different things, which you'll see me do here. It's when I bring out the C plus files. So as you can see, still just a little bit short, but at this point, I do have length now on those distals. Just want to confirm, and we are, we're all on round 21. Now, ML, you'll see me using the C plus file. Remember, the difference between C plus and C files is not only are they active, which means that they're actually sharp on the end, whereas every other K file is blunted, they're also an O3 taper. So they are more stiff, and you can push on them a little bit. Now, th that file I was pushing on. That one you do want to have a fair amount of pressure because what I was trying to do is just pop through that final apical, probably millimeter, maybe two. You can see I'm, I'm just a little bit short on those mesials. So just that's where you can actually use a little bit of pressure. I could feel that I dropped in, and that's why I went straight to the rotaries. Sometimes I think I'm pretty sure the, that video is out. I'm not sure if it's out yet. I, I get lost on how many of these I have going out at once. But there is a video somewhere out there that shows me working through 6, 8, 10, 6, 8, 10, going up to 15, sometimes going back to 6. And it's not something I have to do on every case, but on the cases where you do have to do it, it's nice to know that it's in your back pocket there. So going back down here, you can see the distals now are looking great. Um, I think I actually finished, I know I said earlier that I was going to finish to an F1. At this point, I think I was just happy to be done with everything, and I ended up finishing to a 2006. That's more than aggressive enough, and actually kind of fits the shape of it as well. And the... You can see we're finally down to where we need to be, um, which is fantastic. So do a big rinse here, get all that nastiness out. Um, at this point, you can see we're really not seeing a lot of bubbles either. That's that's a very good sign. Remember, the sodium hypochlorite only works on organic material. So that's stuff like pulp tissue. That's things like bacteria, pus. Once you don't see bubbles anymore, then you're not really doing too, too much. You then can switch to something like EDTA if you're having trouble getting down to the bottom here. Uh, I couldn't actually see the stripe. We uh, label ours using the stripes on here, so I'm pretty sure I did switch to EVTA for the work on those mesials, but unfortunately you couldn't see it, so I, I didn't label it, but just know that I went through probably five syringes of stuff on here. Um, don't use that on every case, but sometimes you do. Now, I did go back in with the activator tip just because of that lateral canal. I was trying to see if I could get something forced into that lateral canal. Um, unfortunately, don't really see much on on the calcium hydroxide shot here, but I like to go back in on cases where you see any weird anatomy with the activator to try to force that calcium hydroxide into any little nook and cranny just to make sure the tooth has the best chance possible. Anytime you use the endo activator, you then have to fill the calcium hydroxide in that area that you just took it back down and go ahead and put our sponge in, cav it. You guys all know how this goes. So go ahead and show you what the temp looks like. But before you do that, I always, always, always check the bite. I haven't really shown any videos of that, so I'm going to show what that looks like. Go ahead and use your AccuFilm. And remember, when you're adjusting the bite here, you want to use the bull rule. So the buckle of the uppers and the lingual of the lowers. If you see marks there, take it out of the bite. Every endo tooth, in my opinion, should have what we call implant occlusion. So light-centric in light centric forces, no lateral forces whatsoever. You'll notice that I am adjusting the surrounding teeth as well. And that's because if you, especially with molars, I found, and look at how big that mark was there. <laughs> um, that's two, two things here. When you start to adjust the teeth, you'll find that the patient can start to bite down a little bit harder because sometimes it's just one little tiny interference that's stopping them from biting all the way. So keep checking it. And number two, you want to adjust multiple teeth here. I usually do one on either side because I've seen it where I adjust it and it starts to affect other teeth as well. So that's what it looks like. Not really loving that calcium hydroxide shot on the mesial, but thankfully a month later it came back, everything was good. Now, unfortunately, this is the only video I have from the first 10 minutes of the appointment and then it just goes to black. <laughs> So um, at this point, I don't know what happened, but I've gone back down with the 20K file. Everything's great to length. I have done a final rinse with bleach, EDTA, activator, and isopropyl alcohol. I have dried the canals, and now we are getting ready for obturation. So I don't know why my camera decided to go black for, you know, 20 minutes, but or 15 minutes, or whatever it was, but here we are. So I wanted to show the obturation because a few people had asked how we do the squirt fill. If you're going to do it for the first time, I highly, highly, highly recommend doing it on a shape like an F1 because it's so easy to fill. What you're going to do, inject until you bind it in the actual canal, back up about a millimeter, 
squirt or you know inject the material until you feel it start to push you out a little bit and then you're going to go back down with your plugger or condenser in this case i like to use the 35 from bnl with a night tie that's really important so it follows the shape of the actual canal and you'll see i go down you know the working length here was 21 i'm going down about yeah, 13, 14, maybe 15 on an open case, you really don't have to take the tip of your plugger farther than that. The pressure inside there just becomes amplified. I believe it's a square if I remember my physics correctly, but it becomes amplified way more than you'd think. And I'm not really pushing that hard. I mean, I would say I'm pushing with about the same force as, I don't know, maybe four-ish pounds of pressure. If you, if you do the... Um, push down on the table with your finger until it starts to blanch a little bit. That's about the force that I'm doing. You really don't want to push too hard here. Uh, th but that's pretty much the technique. And then backfill that area that you just filled in uh, with the beta unit or whatever you guys are using and seal it up. And this is live. That's the live. That's how long it took me to complete the case as far as obturation. So that was about a minute and a half, give or take. So not too bad from start to finish for obturation on those cases. Now, on this one, I did go back in right away with the Pac Mac. I do want to get into all those little nooks and crannies as best as possible. So I'm really not worried. This one didn't have a large apical finding or anything where I'm worried about blowing out the end. So I go straight with the Pac Mac here. And you can see the technique. Sometimes it'll grab that gutta percha, start to move it to the wall if that happens, and it becomes a little bit more liquefied as you go down. And there, it does also look a lot nicer. I don't know what happens when you heat up gutta percha with the Pac Mac, but it's so much nicer to clean off. <laughs> now, speaking of cleaning off, you'll notice that little piece is just stuck in there. Um, sometimes I'll go in with a burr, but this one is so loose. You can see I'm picking at it, picking at it. Um, right down below in the comments, if you figure out how I'm going to get this out, because it's probably not what you think. <laughs> but that's pretty much how the technique works and we go and take an x-ray after this as far as uh, for those of you who guessed um air water syringe a little bit of air popped it out beautifully so that's what it looks like when it was all nice and dry inside there once again sorry the video decided to crap out here's what it looks like when it's obturated still a nice small access you know relatively speaking a little bit larger than i do normally but smaller than probably the than the initial and here's what the final looks like. Might be just a tiny little lateral if you look closely on the mesials. But this doctor, I've worked with him for a long time. He likes to restore his own teeth. Good friend of mine, so we'll send it back to that. As always, thank you so much for watching. Please leave a comment below if you have any questions. If you like the video, if you hate the video, I read everyone and try to respond as best as possible in a timely fashion. And as always, thank you so much for watching.